All right. So tying in some things from uh, earlier on in the class about how external things can change our internal environment and therefore behavior. Uh, remember the fight or flight response where we have a physical change in our body um, due to a perceived harmful event, um, so either being attacked or threatened um, in some way. And remember your body has certain reactions where it will um, release glucose from um, your liver for energy, for cellular respiration to either fight or run and flee. Um, it increases your heart rate and your breathing rate to get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, this was just a repeat from the previous slide. But, um, so, organisms learn from their previous behavior. All right, in the last slide, there's no, there's no puzzle blanks on this. It's just that some behavior on the animals, they work in cooperation with one another. And so, so I just want to talk about that and how that increases the survival of the population. So, predator warning calls. So, these vervet monkeys. Um, they have warning calls where if one monkey uh, sees a predator, it will sound a, a, a call out that the other monkeys know that is an alarm call and then they prepare to um, either run away or hide or something like that because they know that there's danger present. And the vervet monkeys, their calls are really um, unique to the type of predator. So the way that they call let other monkeys know what type of organism is in the is coming. So, for instance, a leopard. Um, a leopard has it says here a loud barking sound. Not the leopard. The monkeys make the loud, loud barking sound in response to seeing a leopard. Um, versus an eagle, they have a different call, and so therefore, young monkeys learn from an early age what these different calls mean, and therefore can prepare accordingly that way. And so, it's the, helpful for the survival of the whole population. And the last thing with cooperative behavior, an example, is pack behavior. So wolves, for instance. Wolves travel in packs, they hunt in packs, and so that's helpful for the survival of the whole population. Why? Because it increases the chance of them killing um, uh, the, uh, the prey, it helps with their hunt, and therefore everybody gets to be fed, and so on. All right, so that's in working in cooperation with one another. All right, and so that is the end of 52. Or 51. We're going to now move on. Yesterday you picked up. We'll see you next. of organisms. So um, the first thing is we need to know what a population is. So a population is a group of individuals of a single species living in the same general area with one another. And so you can have a population of squirrels in a forest here in Clarkston and you can have a population of the same species of squirrels in a forest in Indiana and there would be two different populations. All right so Populations are usually described by their boundaries and their size. So we're going to look at a couple of things that relate to that and a couple of um, pieces of information that give you some data about the population. The first one is density and the second thing is dispersion. So <clears throat> density by definition. Um, density, the number of individuals per unit area or volume. So, for instance, if you have, let's say this is one, a, a square mile, so one mile by one mile area, and let's say you have five individuals here in the area, uh, 
uh, our density would be five individuals per square mile. All right, so that's, that's, that's density. So that gives you a little bit of information. Density is basically the crowdedness versus dispersion. Dispersion is the pattern of spacing among the individuals within the boundaries of the population. So, so we know that five individuals are in this square mile, but do all five of them travel together in a pack? Are they all together? Um, or are they more territorial and are more evenly spaced out? Um, and so that's another piece of information um, besides density. So we're gonna look at each one of these, density and dispersion here. So density, in most cases, in real life, in the wild, it's impractical and in some cases it would be impossible to actually go out and count the number of individuals in a particular area. So imagine that you have 10 acres of land. Can you imagine going out and counting all the ants? All right, in there. That would be a nightmare. All right, so would not um, uh, wish that on anybody. So what they can do, instead of going out and actually physically counting, you can use sampling techniques, can be used to estimate the density densities and to therefore total population sizes. So population size can be estimated by either extrapolation from small samples, an index of population size, or the mark recapture method. So extrapolation from small samples. So going back to that square mile um, piece of land, Instead of going one square mile uh, uh, and counting all the individuals, what you might do is take a smaller part of that area and count how many individuals are in that smaller part and then figure out how many of those smaller parts would be in your larger area. And then once you count how many individuals here, you can multiply by how many parts there are in the whole, and that will give you a, a nice estimate about the population size, and then you can figure out density, all right, because that would be per square mile. Um, the mark recapture method, um, anybody know anything about this? Or what it is? track them and so on and then you can also use it to determine and estimate density so using the mark recapture method scientists capture tag and release a random sample of individuals in a population the chef has some math in it um, some calculations so if you're a math person you'll be happy about this if not bear with me all right <laughs> Marked individuals are given time to mix back into the population. So they capture them, they tag them, put them back into the population, and give them time to remix back in the population. So they're all spread out and remixed, all right? Then they come back a second time and capture a second sample. Of individuals and note how many of them are marked, um, and I call that X here. All right, so, so let's focus on, I'm gonna talk about this, this equation here, how it says the population size then is estimated by this equation based upon this information, and let, let me try and make sense of that. So I'm gonna write up here, so let's say here's your second sample. So this is after you've taken, you've captured some, you've tagged them all, you've put them back into the environment and you let them all mix through. So then you wait maybe a month or so and you capture another sample size, all right? And so, so it says the, the second sample, you know how many of them are marked. So what we wanna do is see the ratio of how many are marked compared to our sample size. So you take, for the second sample, you take the number marked and divide it by the number that you captured. So example, let's say the second sample, um, you, you gathered some and let's say that you had 16 of them that you captured. You look at these 16 and you count, oh, there, let's say, let's make math easy here. Let's say eight of them are marked. 
right? So there's our tag. So how we use that data to estimate the sample size is now we compare this to the first sample. So what do we do before we even did this? We took a random number of individuals all right, let's say 16. All right, let's say we took 16 out of the population, and those are the ones that we tagged. And so in the first sample, we take then the number that we tagged. And then <coughs> we don't know what the population size was. So we took 16 individuals out of this unknown population. But mathematically, what they said, say is what the ones that you tagged and marked and put back in, that that, the, that ratio should be the same as the ratio that you captured in the second sample. So you took 16, um, eight of them were marked, and so we should have the same ratio there as far as the number tagged compared to the number of individuals. So um, this is the total number in the population. And so I'm going to put an equal sign in between there, saying that these ratios should be the same. So let's say I took 16 here. All right. And then, so what, what we would do is solve for this. And so in looking at our population then, our second, um, uh, how many are marked? They say this is X and this is N. This is your total population. And this was S. So where they get this number here, or this equation, is from this equation solving for n. So it makes it mathematically make sense, all right? Um, and so, so it would be n x equals s n, and then n would be s n divided by x. All right. So I just wanted to make sure, just kind of explain that uh, to you. So that's, that's another way to to estimate, and it gives you an estimate. It's not exact, but it gives you an estimate of the population size. And so that's realistically what they do, because in most cases can't go out and count all these individuals, especially like in the ocean or something like that. Could you also get the same result by saying um, population size is n, that's equal to uh, sn over x, which is going to give you 0.5, so you know that's 50% of the population, so that you multiply that by 2 and you get 32, which would be the same, I think, as what is shown there with which total number of your uh, tag. Didn't you just use that equation? Well, yeah, so, but instead of, of using a tag, you just set that equal to what what the number, uh, so 8 over 16 is going to be 0.5, that's going to equal n, you know that's 50% of the population, to get your total population size, you have to make that equal to 1, so you multiply by 2. All right, so they've done this with, like I said, it's hard to do this with things in the ocean. So they've done this with dolphins um, uh, and so on, uh, where they tag them and then can go and do those calculations to figure out density. So density, or how crowded the organisms are in their, in their space, um, takes into account, says, is an interplay between processes that add individuals to a population and those that remove individuals. What kinds of things add individuals to a population? Births. What else? Migration. And so, um, so immigration is what the type of migration where we're adding individuals to the population and emigration is the movement of individuals out. So therefore they would decrease the population size. And if the area stayed the same, then the population uh, density would decrease if you have individuals moving out. And so this picture takes into account those two things, births and immigration, adding to the population, deaths and emigration, of taking away from the population. If the area that the population lives in stays the same and you have more coming in, the, the individual population would become more dense or more crowded. If you have more individuals leaving than you have coming in, it'll become less dense. And so, so that's one thing is density that we actually used to measure and study populations. The second thing is the pattern of what we call dispersion how they're spread out throughout the land. 
Um, so environmental and social factors influence the spacing of individuals in a population in clumped dispersion. Individuals aggregate in patches. Um, and this can be influenced by resource availability or uh, behavior. So, so we have a picture here of clumped dispersion here. And so here's a particular area of land. Um, and the individuals, when you look at how their, their pattern about how they hang out in that land, these guys are clumped together. So the clumping together, we just wrote, could be because of resource av availability. So, so it may be that there are food sources in particular areas, so therefore you get a large amount of individuals in one particular area, or there's a water um, source. Or if it's plants, maybe availability of sunlight or um, nutrient-rich soil would clump the individuals in one particular area. Not all um, show clumps. Some show what we call a uniform pattern. So here would be like an animal that's territorial. So they, they keep other animals out of their territory. So therefore the animal, the different members of that population are more spread out that way and are more evenly distributed. Um, another example with plants here would be some plants release chemicals into the ground, into the soil that prevent other plants from growing. And so that's beneficial for the plant because then they don't compete for anything. They don't have to compete for the sunlight and so on, space and so on, so they prevent other individuals and so therefore they would be more evenly spread out that way um, if it's random there's no rhyme or reason to the pattern so they may be close together in some areas far apart in other areas um, and so on and so when it's random this an example would be like windblown seeds like dandelion seeds you know little fuzzy things or the little at the end of each one of those little fuzz is a little seed which is a baby it has a baby plant in it for that particular dandelion so the wind just takes them and randomly lets them fall and so they randomly grow in various areas and then you get that random distribution. So let's write about these other two. Uniform distribution, that's one of which individuals are evenly distributed. Maybe influenced by social interactions such as territoriality, so I use that example. Whereas we have the random dispersion. The position of each individual is independent of other individuals. It occurs in the absence of strong attractions or repulsion. So it's just random. Okay. So for the next little bit, um, for the next couple sections in this chapter, actually, we're going to look at um, a, a, a part of a study of populations called um, demography, where you look at statistics of a population and how they change over time. So how, um, so looking over time, and two statistics that we focus on is death and birth rates. If you know the death and the birth rate for a population, what information can you tell about the population from knowing both the birth and the death rate? That's right. Whether or not it's increasing or decreasing. If the birth rate is higher than the death rate, you have an increase in population. Vice versa, if the birth rate is lower than the death rate, you're going to get a decrease in the population. So we're going to look at some various ways to study that and look at... Um, uh, and what it can tell us about a population. So, first thing, this has to do with more of the death rate here. It's something that they made from, uh, from data about the population is called a survivorship curve. It's a graphic way of representing the number or proportion of individuals surviving to each age for a given species or group. So, <clears throat> you have a picture of uh, survivorship curve for this Belding's ground squirrel and it says it shows a relative constant death rate but let's look at what it actually shows so 
What a survivorship curve does is we have time on the x-axis, so this is the age of the squirrel, starting at time zero, which is when the squirrel is born. Then you have the number of survivors. So what they do is they look at, like, so this is, let's look at the female gr ground squirrels here. We start out with 100 births. So 100 baby ground squirrels are born. A thousand baby ground squirrels are born. So then we look at, go to, by year one, halfway through here, out of those 1,000, not all of them are still alive. There's less than 1,000 still alive. Um, and so therefore, some have died. And so that's what the survivor, the number of survivors is showing. So as the number of survivors go down over time, that means that more and more squirrels, uh, that they're dying over time as well. And so that tells, that's your survivorship curve. Now let's look at what we just wrote here. That this, this survivorship curve, curve shows a relatively constant death rate. So looking at this graph here, how could, can somebody explain to me how they figured out that the building ground squirrel has a relatively constant death rate from this survivorship curve? Max? Maybe the size of the population doesn't change. All right, the, the size of the population, well, the, the Oh, I see what you have. So, but, but we have over time more and more, less and less survivors, which means more and more individuals die. So the population. But if the birth rate also constant, then the population is not going to given time period, like every two years, let's say, or something like that, the number of, um, uh, you can calculate the number of deaths um, by figuring out how many were surviving here, how many surviving here, divided by a particular time period, and then you can get the, um, how many deaths per, in that case, given year, out of those 1,000 individuals. And so that's where they get, because the line is relatively straight, um, and uh, the, the rate of, the, of these thousand individuals are dying off at a constant rate. Does that make sense? All right. And so before you write that, I'm going to flip to the next page and look at this graph. This graph shows you three survivorship curves. They call them they, type 1, type 2, and type 3. This is supposed to be, no, oh, yours says 3, mine did so here's what we just looked at, the ground squirrel. Here's the survivorship curve for humans. Um, this is what we call the survivorship curve type one. Um, looking at that for humans, if you were to look at that and not know what the organism is, but just see the shape of that curve, what would you say about the that, that population of individuals? What could you tell about it from looking at the survivorship curve? There's some information that you should be able to say about that particular population. Liam? Um, I would guess that they're probably at the top of the food chain. Okay. Well, how, how from this can you tell that? So the reason why is because the population doesn't die until uh, they reach a certain age. Uh, which means they're not being like hunted off or something. They're not, uh, you know, like dying at birth because you know, like an eagle swoops them up or something like that. Uh, so, like, I, 
I'm sure if you like show it another like species like wolves, you'd also like see something like that because uh, predators die from usually like old age or starvation, like because of old age. Right. Um, and uh, if you see that in, in humans, it's usually an indication that they're like more higher up. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we can infer from that, this this particular graph doesn't say, there's nothing on here that says for sure that they're on the top of the food chain, but this is the case of organisms that are on the top of the food chain. So from the data on here, what else can we tell about the food? Because what Liam said is true. But then directly from the information here, what could you tell? Okay, most humans don't live past 100, okay, or, or a certain age, all right, because then it goes down. What else can you infer? So it definitely gives you roughly the, not very many people, you know, you don't have 200 old humans. What else? Matt? Yeah. Uh, they start dying off around 50 years old. Yeah, they start dying off. It gives you a, when they start dying off. So. So basically, notice this line is pretty horizontal for a good portion of the human's life. So therefore, what is this telling you? The number of survivors. So out of those thousand human babies born, quite a lot of those a thousand are living to a certain age and it's not until you get older that they start dying off. And so you have survivorship for a long period of time versus um, this survivorship curve number three, notice here we start at time zero to thousand verse, but look at here, we get an immediate drop right away. Um, and so we're getting less and less of those a thousand actually surviving, and then it levels off um, to that. And so what does this tell us? That out of a thousand births, most of them die off right away and only a few survive. The few that do survive can last a, a, a while, but, but there's only a few out of those 1,000 that actually make it. And so, so um, uh, organisms like this usually have lots of children. So like, for instance, like um, I have maple trees in my yard and it sometimes drives me crazy because what happens is they make those little helicopters. Those helicopters have seeds in them. Those are the baby plants of that. They produce like thousands, this feels like a billion to me, but like they, <laughs> they produce tons of these. Get all over everything and so on. But they produce the, all these seeds. Do every one of those develop into a maple tree? No. And so, yeah, thankfully. <laughs> You have great hair. I'm trying to take them all off. So, because I sometimes a few of them do sprout out. Like I get them in my flower beds, little trees trying to grow up. I have to pull them out and stuff like that. But only a few out of those survive. And so that would be an example of um, a type three curve. All right. And so, all right. So going back now, I want you to go back to the three blanks that we. All right, so see if you can fill in those three blanks based upon our discussion. So that's what we see in type one, that's us. Um, type two has the constant death rate, and type three starts out very high death rate, so they would get that drop, but then it lowers for any individuals that survive. And so we have these three categories of survivorship curves, but many species don't kind of fit nice and neat in one of those three, so some of them are intermediate between them, so not every organism on earth can be packaged into one of those. All right, but those are three main categories. All right, so, so let's look now. We're going to look at two ways that populations can grow. 
grow and look at two different growth models. Exponential growth model says describes population growth in an idealized, unlimited environment. What's an idealized, unlimited environment? So there's usually a study population growth in an idealized situation. It helps us to understand the capacity of species to increase and the conditions that may facilitate this growth. Idealized conditions for population, what would that look like? You'd have unlimited space and unlimited resources. So therefore the population could reproduce at a maximum rate. They could have kids as fast as they physically could, all right? And all of those new individuals in the population would have enough space, water, resources, and so on. And it would be growing at the fastest rate it can. So that's an idealized condition. Um, or an idealized environment. Realistically, is that the case always? No, all right. Um, it may be the case for a while where if you have a small population, you have a lot of resources, they can grow exponentially for a while, but then eventually it'll run out of resources and they'll limit the population growth. So, <clears throat> so in this section is when we start to look at some mathematical equations, all right? So, um, so as an intro, change in population size. We take the two things that um, increase the population size, births plus the immigrants, and subtract two things, minus the deaths and the emigrants. And so, <coughs> so if immigration and emigration are ignored, a population's growth rate, or its per capita increase, um, equals birth rate minus death rate. So from now on, as we look at change in population size, we're going to right now ignore immigration and emigration and just focus on births and deaths as, as it relates to um, change in population size. So the population growth rate can be expressed mathematically as this equation here. So delta N, remember delta that uh, is the, which means a change, over delta T equals B minus D. Delta N is the change in population size. Delta T is the time interval. And B is the number of births, and D is the number of deaths. can be expressed as the average number of births and deaths per individual during the specified time interval. So we're going to change instead of B and D, we're going to say B equals little b n and D equals little m n, where B, the little b, is the annual per capita birth rate. M, stands for mortality, is the per capita death rate. And N is the population size. And you don't have this bullet here, but I'm using this word per capita. So like when it says per capita birth rate, um, so, so that is the number of offspring produced per time period by an average member of the population. So um, like, so for instance, in the United States, it would be like the average person has 2.1 kids per year or, or per given time period. Or whatever, um, and so on. Um, or two you would do it like that. Let me something. So let me explain and let's talk about what this B and M is. So I'm going to use an example of how to figure out death rate. So let's figure out how to do death rate here in M. So we're going to do a death rate example. So let's say 
for population, this is the number alive at the beginning of the year. So let's say there are 337, whatever organism this is, um, there's 337 of them alive at the beginning of the year. And then we're going to write the number of deaths. So then we figure out the number of deaths um, during the year. And let's say that that is 207. So I want to figure out the death rate from that. How do you think you would figure that out? survive. So we want to focus on the number of deaths. So I give you the number of deaths right there, right? 207. Why can't I just say 207 individuals died per year? Why is that, that not the best way to describe a, a, a death rate? Because you don't know if all 207 died at like one time with the results of their health. Okay, so the timing of it. Yeah, absolutely. You have no point of comparison there. Um, and so, so, <coughs> so, um, uh, and so, what would we have to do to make it so that we can compare death rates between um, populations? What do we have to do? Would you take the uh, mortality rate and divide it by the Well, we don't have the mortality rate. Oh, sorry. The number uh, we're of trying deaths. to figure out the mortality rate. Okay, yeah. So the number of deaths per year divided by the number of births per year. All right. Divided by the number of births or the number of people or individuals in oh, the population right. total. Yeah. This is po total population size. So in this case, that equation would look like what? What would we do? 207 over 337. All right. So... So 207 divided by 337. And when you do that, we get, what do you get? 0.61424. All right, I'm just going to abbreviate, uh, round to 0.61. All right, and so we get this um, M as the, the, the death rate. And so then, if you know what the death rate is of a population, then, and you know the um, population size, um, then you can figure out how many individuals would be, would die that year. If you know the population size and know, let's say we want to figure out what, predict, you know, this year, um, what the number of deaths would be, we could take maybe last year's death rate, all right, let's say it was 0.61, and look at the number of individuals we start with at the beginning of the year, multiply that, and I'll give you an idea of how many deaths we can expect for that year. Does that make sense? All right, and so, so that's what that means. So, so now, notice here we substituted this for B and D. So now, now we can transform our equation to this, where delta n over delta t instead of v minus d, it's vn minus mn. So earlier we just wrote v minus d. So we substituted v and d for those two things that we just looked at. Does that make sense? So now, building on here, the per capita rate of increase is given by R equals B minus M. B is the birth rate, right? M was the death rate. So instead of writing B minus N to figure out what's happening to the population, um, we can use this letter R here, um, which is B minus N. So let's say the birth rate was 0.23, 
and the death rate is 0.27. What does that tell you about the population? It's decreasing because we have a higher death rate than the birth rate, all right? Um, and if we flip those numbers, it would be increasing. And so <coughs> the bigger difference between the birth and the death rate, the bigger increase and the bigger de decrease. If the birth rate and the death rate are the same, we have zero population growth. So that R would be zero, all right? And so therefore we'd have no increase or decrease. So now looking at this rate of increase, we can change now a little bit our, our problem. This is supposed to be, this is, oh, no. <laughs> this is Delta N. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of look like a Christmas tree. So delta n over delta t equals r n. Let me explain why that would make sense. Oops. So, <coughs> so going back to here, whoops, here. Let me explain here why this now, we just changed this to Rn. So do you see that this equation, it would be the same if I took B minus M, multiply it by N, all right, that's the same. What did we just say B minus M is the same as? R, so therefore our equation now is Rn, all right? All right? Okay, follow me? All right. All right. All right, so this is the next thing. We just wrote this. Change of population size. Can we written as our N? Instantaneous growth rate can be expressed as they call Now notice here, we change it a little bit. Where it says dn. It was delta n, right? Remember that? The delta n. dn over dt. This is a calculus expression. For this class, we do not need calculus um, to, to understand this. So what, um, so what for what we're doing in this class, you can think of it as just the change in n over the change in time. Okay, so for, for all intents and purposes here. Um, this instantaneous growth rate, what we're going to look at is under idealized conditions. So maybe add this to your notes. Under idealized conditions, this... This equation looks like this. Oh, we're going to use D and DT equals R max. This right here, well, I guess I should do it all. This right here is what the equation looks like on the A. by the D's, it's just the change in the population size over time. Um, R max, what that means, under idealized conditions, idealized conditions means that unlimited resources, right? So therefore the population can grow at the fastest rate it can because there's enough of everything to go around. So that's what means R max is the maximum rate of growth, all right? And so that's um, what that is. And so that's what you need to know. So we're get, we're, we address this here in this next part. So populations that have this idealized condition are said to experience exponential population growth, population increase under idealized conditions. So that rate of increase that we just talked about, the rate of increase is at its maximum, and that's your R max. And this is, I'm going to change this to max to be consistent with the eight. growth looks like. Um, it <coughs> results in what they call a J-shaped curve because it looks like the, the way that it, it, it curves looks like the capital letter J. A yeah. uh, rate of increase is constant, but the population accumulates more individuals per unit time when it's large than when it's small. Mm -hmm. 
individuals, accumulates more new individuals per unit time when it's large than when it's small. So if you look at the graph, good. All right, we have two, you can see the J-shaped curve. All right, so that's exponential growth. We're, they're measuring time in generations, and this is the number of individuals, this is the population size. So we have two different populations where their R max is different. So this is, remember, R max n, so the R max is 1 versus um, 0.5. But that represents the rate, the maximum rate of growth for that particular population. So you see that this is half. Um, the rate of growth, the maximum rate of growth in this one, so therefore it's still growing exponentially, but it just grows at half the rate, all right? So therefore it takes longer, all right? Uh, and um, this is the number of individuals. So let's say we have two populations that had an R max of one. Um, let's say one population was really large. So let's say it was a thousand individuals. So that means per generation you'd have thousand individuals times the maximum growth rate, which is one, you'd have a thousand new individuals every generation. Does that make sense? Versus if you had a n is you only had 500 in the population, it would grow, it still will grow exponentially, but it would increase less every year than the first one because the population is, is smaller. All right. And so, <coughs> so that's exponential growth. So this J-shaped curve of exponential growth characterizes some rebounding populations. So this, this is a real life scenario in which you would see a population growing exponentially. Remember, you have to have idealized conditions. So um, this happened in, with the elephants in South Africa. They were hunted to almost near extinction before they put in some conservation efforts and some laws to make it illegal for them to hunt. Uh, be hunted and therefore could rebound in number and not go to extinction. So, <coughs> so we see here very few elephants, all right, for a long period of time, and then they put in some conservation efforts and laws, and those elephants began to grow exponentially. Why? Because they had killed them off, so there are so few of them in this huge amount of space. There were a lot of resources, but there were so few of them that they could grow exponentially for a while because there were enough resources until you get to the near the, what's called the carrying capacity, which is the um, maximum number of individuals that the environment can support. And then what would happen is when it gets to carrying capacity, what would happen to this line? It's gonna go down like this? No, it's gonna, Plateau, that's right, I'll go off. Absolutely. And that is called logistic growth. So look at this. So logistic model is, so exponential growth can't be sustained for long because you run out of resources. A more realistic population model limits growth by incorporating this thing called a carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is represented by the letter K. The maximum population size the environment can support. And it varies with the abundance of limiting resources. So if you have a lot of resources, the carrying capacity will be higher versus um, lower if there's, if there's not a lot of resources. So, oh, yep, I can. Good? Okay, so let's now uh, look at this mathematically. So the logistic population growth model, the per capita rate of increase declines as carrying capacity is reached. The logistic model starts with the exponential model and adds an expression that reduces the per capita rate of increase as n approaches k. That's a lot of, lot of stuff there. That has the equation. I'll talk about it.
All right, so let's look at this. If I notice here the equation, if I cover up this part, this is the exponential equation right here, r max n, meaning that it's growing at the maximum rate um, the, the, that it can. So realistically, as the population approaches carrying capacity, I know it's nearing the end of the hour, but I need on this video to get to where I ended the first hour, so just hold your horses for a few minutes. Okay, so the carrying capacity, we have to add in the second part here. So let's not even look at this part right here. Let's look at this part here. K is the carrying capacity. So let's say you have this high carrying capacity, and N is the number of individuals that are actually alive in the population. So if N is really low compared to the carrying capacity, let's say you're not anywhere near the carrying capacity. Mathematically, if you look at this, k minus n divided by k, if this number is really low compared to this number, when you divide this out, what's the number going to be close to? 1, right? k divided by k is going to be close to 1. As n increases, so now the population may be growing exponentially for a while, and n is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. What's happening to this number as n gets closer to k? It's going to get closer and closer to zero. It's going to lower and lower and lower until eventually when n reaches the carrying capacity, what's this number going to be? If n is k are the same. Zero, right? And if we take then the growth rate and there's zero here, then there's going to be zero growth because n, the number of individuals, is equal to the number of individuals that can be supported. All right? So therefore, when n is really low, you have a really high growth rate. This number is going to be close to one and you're going to have close to the maximum rate. But as n increases, this number gets lower, which lowers this, and it's not going to be at the maximum rate anymore until eventually it's zero. All right? Does that make sense? Okay. So that's where I can start. So that sheet of paper that you picked up here today, hold on to it tomorrow. We're going to do some calculations with this.